When it comes to money, the vast majority of us, well, we're nuts. That's according to author Helene Olin in her new book, Pound Foolish, exposing the dark side of the personal finance industry. She reveals the people and groups that purport to help us, but in reality, only prey on our fear and greed. Welcome, Helene. Hi there. So, you know, you really don't hold back. You go from <laughs> Susie Orman to Dave Ramsey, David Buck. You don't think much of these people. Well, I feel like we've been living through the economic equivalent of Hurricane Sandy for the past several years. And these people are telling us, hey, just buy a few umbrellas and sandbags, and no matter what wave comes your way, you're going to be fine. And by the way, they're the ones selling us the sandbags and umbrellas, and they don't often disclose that. And what's interesting is that, I mean, on some level, they're peddling just kind of tried and true advice, live within your means, right. but is there any danger to what they're doing? Well, what they're doing is, is they're saying it's all your fault. Mm -hmm. And that's the big problem because on one hand, of course, there's nothing wrong with that. You should live within your means. Although, as I say, it's really hard to live within your means if you're getting a $300 a week unemployment check. Right. But most of us are it. But what they're doing is, is they're denying the pressures that are on us. You know, our salaries have stagnated and fallen for, for well over a decade now. And what they're doing is saying, you know, you're going to be fine if you live within your means while they ignore the fact that our health care costs have gone up at rates beyond inflation. Housing has gone up at rates beyond inflation. Uh, education has gone up at rates beyond inflation. They're just ignoring all of that. And to some extent, they're really awesome marketers, right? And right. They, they really are great at selling their stuff. Right. Um, talk about how what, what kind of appeal that has, because there is something interesting about people who call up and ask to get beaten up. Right. For, why are we doing that? What is that about us? I think what it is, is as I say, we're nuts when it comes to money, and all we want is someone to tell us what to do. Most of us don't want to engage with our money, even though we need to. And so the idea is, is, hey, I'll just follow this person and they'll tell me what to do. We also in this country have a huge attraction to this sort of tough thinking about money where anybody can make it and it's your fault if you don't make it. Yeah, talk about this shift because on some level there was sort of a cheerleader aspect to this, right? right? We want you to do good and take control, but then it turned a little bit nasty and you call it authoritative nastiness. It's, I love that term. It's almost like an Ayn Rand self-determinism book meets a Victorian morality tract. Oh my gosh. It's this idea that we're all responsible for our own financial fates, no matter how awful the world is out there. And yes, to some extent we are, but most of us aren't shopaholics. Most of us are not terrifically extravagant spenders. But if you would listen to these gurus, our problems are coming from all of that. Dave Ramsey has gone on record as saying you can choose not to participate in a recession. I don't know about you, but I'm I'd still love to choose that. Yeah, I'm still thinking that one through. And, you know, David Box, the whole idea of, oh, just give up small luxuries and you'll save up a million dollars. Well, never mind the math of it. It's the idea is, is, wait a second, our problem isn't the small luxuries. We like to think it. And in one sense, it makes sense that we think it, because, as I always say, it's what I would see every day. If I ran into you on the street, I might well see you holding a Starbucks. I might not see if you needed a, an expensive prescription drug that your health insurance company is no longer covering. Mm -hmm. So to me, it would just look like, oh, she's having financial problems because she can't give up that Starbucks. And you referenced something that was interesting that now Senator Elizabeth Warren and her daughter wrote a book. And I remember this book because I had them on my radio show years ago when right. they first wrote this book called The Two Income Trap. And this really does bring to light that there are big issues that the middle class faces that are right. much bigger than your latte here and your extra lunch out there. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, as I said, our, our costs are going up at extraordinary rates. We really shouldn't live without our health care bills. Mm -hmm. You do need to go to the doctor. You do need to get a college education if you want to get ahead in this country. And there's very little way you and I are go going to control those costs, really, except to say, well, maybe this college is a little less expensive than that one. But that still doesn't take away the fact that the cost of college is going up. It or that you want to live in the neighborhood with a good school right. system and the houses are more expensive. Exactly, there. and that's another huge point. Who wants to sentence their children to a sub-tier school district just because the houses are too expensive? And, in, and of course, who knows this stuff? The financial services sector. They know this stuff and they're there waiting for you. Oh, and so let's talk about that for a second because, you know, 
You talk in the book a lot about financial literacy being financed almost by right. the financial sector. Can you draw that connection for us sure. a little bit? Sure, and I should backtrack and say that I, this is the section of the book that broke my heart because I still don't really feel there's anything wrong with trying to teach children how to manage their money. What I do think there's something wrong with is saying this is going to be our solve because the evidence shows it's not. Mm. The evidence shows that children who learn this stuff don't seem to do any better than anybody else. And the idea from the financial services sector is we're going to sponsor this, this, these curriculum. We're going to put our name all over this curriculum. And two things come out of that. First, there's brand awareness, which we don't like to really talk much about anymore. But the fact is, is if you see the name Visa by the time you're two years old, studies show you're going to have a favorable take on Visa 20, 30 years out, which seems unbelievable, but it's true. That's why there's credit card Barbie, if you remember that oh, from, from about a decade ago. <laughs> And then the second is this idea that they can control what's being taught. So they're not going to teach you things that aren't in their interests. So, I, I mean, my favorite one of all time is, and this is a computer one, not one in the schools, was Build-A-Bear did a thing on financial literacy, which mysteriously never mentioned that you don't need a $40 plus stuffed animal. Never do that. And, right, yeah, <laughs> that's this is a terrible financial decision. There's a nice $5 stuffed animal right there. And then what they do is they turn around and say, well, if you just learn this stuff, we don't need the um, appropriate legislation to fix the problem. You can take a class in financial literacy in the 12th grade and be able to parse a 30-year mortgage or an adjustable rate mortgage 20 years out that's 100 pages of small print that might well be made up of things that didn't even exist at the time you took the class. So what if, so do you think that we should be talking about this stuff even from early years, just to, I mean, just in terms of math skills? I, I would love, if I had more lived in the ideal world, I would love to see some of it in the math curriculum because I do think the more familiar you are with it, for at least some people it will take, and at this point, hey, better some people than no one. Right. But I also really began to feel, and I didn't discuss this as much in the book as I'd like, that a lot of it really does come at home. And parents need to talk about money with their kids. But as I talk about in the book, that's something we have a huge problem with, and not just with our children. We don't talk about money in our society. Right, it's a psychology issue more than anything where right. people don't want, it somehow brings up all of your fears and, and your, your hopes and your dreams, but it's your fears and your anxieties rolled up into this thing called money, right? Right, well, right. well we live in this society where we really preach that anybody can make it. And unfortunately, that's just not true. We have the class mobility of a you know South American country at this point. It's hidebound Europe is way ahead of us. But you know, to say that that's not happening is, or to say that that's happening, is to challenge the American dream. You know, this is a, a myth, of, a global myth. It's not even our myth. And then people just assume anything that goes wrong is their fault. Mm -hmm. And in turn, the way this works in our daily lives is there's just this powerful, powerful culture of shame that has developed around money. And people seem to be willing to let, the, let people think that they got into debt because they were you know, spending too much money on luxury goods. And they don't want to admit, God, my salary fell 20%. Right. Or you know, my child had a learning issue and the school district wouldn't pay for the, the, the tutoring we needed. They just don't cop to this stuff. And I really became convinced that we needed to start talking about it. But I'm wondering, there are people who want and need advice. Right. And um, in my, I've had friends and I, I, they would say, never should hire anyone. I said, but really there are some people right. who do damage to themselves. What is your advice to those people who are looking around, they say, I want to, I'll, I'll pay for it, I'm willing to pay for it. What's your advice on that? Remember one word fiduciary. Ah, uh, the F word. Or the F word. It's a complicated word. It's got many syllables, but it means that this is somebody who has to act in your best interests. And you should not go to anybody for financial advice or to even have somebody look over your shoulders who is not a fiduciary. And do you think that the industry is going to catch up to that need? Because right now, if I understand it, the fiduciary standard is, is sort of languishing a little right. bit. And I think that 80% of the industry is still commission-based. Right, and I hope so. I think what has to happen, though, for it to change is we have to become more aware of how we're paying for advice. Right now, the surveys show most of us have no clue how our advisors are compensated and how we are paying. Often we think we're not paying and that this is some free service and rest assured it's not a free service. That means that someone is getting paid by various financial services firms to market certain types of products at you. Are you depressed after writing this book? It, I took, I could have been depressed, but I instead sort of took it as a way to be more empowered about my money 
And that just doesn't mean managing my money, but enjoying what I have more and trying not to be as um, judgmental about it. Oh, that's a good takeaway. Well, Helene Olin, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And thanks for watching. Stay tuned right here for more financial and economic information and advice.